Good evening. It's 6.30. We have a quorum. We'll call a planning board meeting to order. And first up for general, for general information is who, Mr. Dwyer? Uh, Matt McTee. Hello. How are you guys doing? Good. How are we all? Good, good. Matt McTeague with um, Hadley Holistics Dispensary, or the dispensary that was looking to open in New Hampshire Mall. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard, uh, the mall is no longer allowing us to lease from them uh, due to a banking issue on their end. So we've been in the position of trying to find a new location, and um, we've exhausted pretty much all of the locations that fit within the uh, zoning bylaws. Uh, a lot of them cite the same thing that their banks, you know, due to COVID, you know, they're looking at leases tighter these days and they won't allow a dispensary to go on their property. So we have found a couple that would lease to us on uh, route nine. Uh, the only problem is they are within the 300 feet of a residential which is really the, the houses along, they're scattered along Route 9 in the business district. Um, we're thinking about applying for a variance. We wanted to see if there's any, you know, op opposition from you guys or any, any additional feedback that there is that we can get from you as a what's whole. The deal, just out of curiosity, what's the deal with the banks not a, being involved and not allowing it? They won't allow it because uh, cannabis is still federally illegal. So they will, they will not take... Uh, money from a federally a business selling federally illegal substance so any anything that's federally insured insured cannot do it uh so okay so these are probably the uh banks that hold the mortgages on the property yep or you know some of these properties are looking for you know uh extra funding in the hard times and things like that so they're doing full reviews of the leases that they hold. Well, the other, you know, certainly you could wait until the election time and see if there's going to be a different climate. Uh, where the, exactly are the locations? The two locations we found um, that would lease to us are 191 Russell and uh, 251, both uh Fitness locations that out during 251 it has what a residential next. Where is it? What? What? 191 and 251, Russell. So where is 191? Uh, if I'm not familiar with the numbers. Okay, that's right in the plaza with um, actually where, where Williams' office is and uh, Bagel Place. Okay. Yep. And then uh, 251 is just a little further up the street, right next to that. Uh, there's a little house there that's vacant. And then there's a bar right there. Um, I forgot the name of it. Okay. And that, yeah, the tap room or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep. That is it. Yep. Um, and that one's a standalone, whereas uh, the other one is in a plaza. When we were just. Discussing all of this, the <clears throat> there was a lot of input from residential neighbors to potential grow sites. There was hardly a peep, as I recall, about locating retail. I think everybody assumed it would go on Route 9. Um, and it does, it does sound like they've made a pretty decent effort to try to find a place that could be used without, um, and I'm not too concerned about preserving the residential nature of Route 9. Uh, I know that there are people who are still living on Route 9. I think some of them are property owners. I think many others have been converted to rentals long since. So um, isn't this about the time you put your lawyer's hat on? and say that uh, you have to designate a hardship to- Well, yeah, it. but I'm not, giving, I'm not giving him legal advice. What he wants is to talk with us about whether we think, um, whether we have any strong opposition to them asking the ZBA. They still have to make their case to the ZBA. I mean, my opinion is a lot of it's gonna be what the neighbors say. If the neighbors don't, 
say much about it. I'm, I don't have a strong opinion if you're located within so many feet of a residence. And what's, what is the nearest residence to these buildings that you're looking Both at? Both of them uh, right next door have a lot that's uh, okay. residential. Okay. One of them's used as an office building still, but it's, it's listed as residential and the other one's vacant. Uh, they both have one across the street as well that I believe people are living in. Okay. So you're, you're close. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Like I said, if the neighbors don't make a noise about it, I don't have a strong opinion about it because you're only going to affect really what three or four neighbors. Pretty much. It, yeah. You know, the rest of them are going to be farther or further away. And if they're not making noise or complaints about it, concerns, then, you know, so be it. That's my two cents. How's the parking at the house that you're looking at? Well, well they're both, um, so one's a plaza, there's ample parking there. Right. And the other one is uh, 251, which is a standalone building. It was a CrossFit gym and it's it's got decent parking and it also has a uh, unpaved area, rocky area behind it. Uh -huh. I believe it sits on like three acres, even though partial is on the, the watershed area there, I believe. Oh, is, um, is 251 the, the gym that was moved out was during the COVID thing? Yep, yep. Oh, that's a good size building. And yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's, it's you know, you relatively got, new. Yeah, you, that, that you, one has very few neighbors. Yeah, and the, the one next door. So you got the psychic on the other side, apparently lives upstairs. And then you have the one next door that's empty. And then next door to that is the bar. And then across the street, you have a house. Right. I have no objection. Yeah, I, I would agree with Jim that, you know, if the neighbors don't care. Okay. I mean, it's Route 9, which, again... Um, we've been promoting as c a commercial development. And, I mean, not to abandon if the, if the landowners there, you know, protested, I, I, I would, I would have their back, but if, if they don't, yeah, I, I don't carry an ax of my own. Okay. And for the most part, what I've seen of the dispensaries, yeah, there's some traffic, but it's not. Yeah, you you can't smoke on site. You can't do anything else. You buy it and you take off. Yeah, and there's enough of them around where it doesn't really, you know, there's enough variety with it. you're not waiting these long lines anymore, and there's not much of an impact on the traffic. Yeah. So. All right. Well, yeah. Though, thank you for the okay. feedback, and I guess you know when we have the hearing, we'll we'll see if any of the neighbors at that point. Yes. You, know how to get to touch with the, you know how to get in touch with the Zoning Board of Appeals? Yep, yep. yep. We already got, got the okay. application on, and we're just getting things together to be able to file. Okay. So, all right. Well, uh, thank you guys for your time and, you know, answering my question. Okay. Thanks for checking in. Yeah, you're welcome. Now, we'll talk to you guys soon. Okay. Good. Thank you. And Mr. Quinlan had checked in next. I was just on to see what's going on. Thank okay. you, though. Just, just curious? Yes, yeah, yeah. Professionally okay. curious. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I'm learning every day. Thank you. That's fine. Tom Reedy was the next one in. Here I am. Thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, hey, everybody. So probably a, a good segue from that uh last informational discussion so we've had plenty of clients who are looking at just different sites uh in hadley um i think i mean obviously it's not the board's decision but the town should be careful of changing the rules to a certain extent if the bylaw says something and then those rules are going to be changed i mean i i can give the other group credit for or this group credit um for trying to get a variance where it's necessary, but I can probably also tell you that we've had, you know, a handful of folks who have just, who have looked at the bylaw and said, this is tough and just have decided not to pursue. But we've got, what I'm really here for is uh, interpretation. And I'm happy that the building commissioner is on um, because I was hoping to get a read from you guys because this is for a, a marijuana facility. 
uh, a dispensary. And when I look at your section 29, there's 29.3.4.2, which I'll read it so you don't have to get your bylaws out. Uh, no RMD or OMMD facility shall be located on a lot which abuts a residential use, including commercial residential uses such as hotels, motels, lodging houses, et cetera, or residential zoning district. So it's still down. It's you can't have a marijuana dispensary on a lot which abuts a residential use or a residential zoning district. And so my my question is, when I read your zoning bylaw, um, you have other places which specifically says, for example, um, where you need the names and addresses of all abutting property owners, including those on opposite side of any street. <clears throat> And then you look at Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 11, which, similar to your bylaw, distinguishes abutters from owners on opposite sides of the street. I guess my question is, if, if I've got a property that is not in a residential district, but is across the street from a residential use, is that okay? Because I think without needing any variance, assuming that's the interpretation, which I think it holds water based on... I think the way the law reads, is that an issue? And so that's that's why I'm here and before we pursue anything else is to get a read of what a but means. Is it property across the street or not? I, mean, I don't recall if there was any opposition, like Jim initially said, uh, regarding the facilities uh, that are going to be selling marijuana, but most of the people came out of the woodwork for the growing of it next to the residential area. And I don't, does anyone recall, did we put that in because there seemed to be some opposition uh, from the residents that they didn't want a dispensary near their house? I don't recall why we put that one in that way. Well, it, they didn't want a grow facility within smelling distance of their house. I think That's that was correct. it. Uh, right. That's right. If they had a rope, they would have hung that guy that night. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I was wondering if, if we put that line in there because it seemed like it would be easier to pass the, uh, the town meeting, or was it just kind of boilerplate maybe from Pioneer Valley? I, I don't recall. I think certainly we were dealing with neighbors who were across the street from grow sites right. when, we, when we addressed that. But you're right, we didn't, it does say a but. So if you're across the street, you don't have but. But there's, there's also something in there about uh, you have to be set back 300 feet from the nearest residential property line, if I'm recalling it off the top of my head. I believe it's property line to property line, 300 feet. And then a school would be the 500 feet property line to property line. What what section was that, Tom? Uh, which Tom, I guess? Tom, Tom Reedy. 29.3.4.2. Uh, I just want to read that myself to get a better. Sure. Because all different, so I do this in, obviously you guys know different towns and all towns measure these things differently. Some are property line to property line, as Mr. Quinlan notes, that's certainly the case for um, proximity to a public or private elementary school, junior high, middle vocational or high school, et cetera. Um, or another RMD or OMMD, except that it won't apply in industrial zones. But then otherwise, your 29.3.4.2 and the subsequent section 29.3.4.3 don't have any, as I see them, proximity requirements. Like you're not saying it, it can't be within 50 feet or 100 feet or you know, 300 feet structure to structure. It is just for 4.2, it's you cannot abut. And my position is what Bill had said, abut across the street is not abutting. And then second, it can't be located inside a building that contains residential units. So you're really only like measurement restriction is under 4.1, 29.3.4.1. 
uh, and it's this a 500 feet property line to property line. But the other two, I don't see them as dealing with measurements that way. And I don't know if I'm missing something, obviously let me know. Well, shouldn't the nature of the road be taken into consideration? I mean, I if, you get a, a if you got a little, if you got a little country lane, <laughs> right. it, it, as far as I'm concerned, if I'm across the street, I'm abutting, no matter what mass law says. Yeah, like a derelict fee statute issue. Yeah, so I mean, in this specific instance, and I don't want to give it away yet, it's a public way. But is it four lane or is it two? Two lane. One in each direction. So through 47, huh? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not going to say I can't confirm or deny. I would I would interpret a butter to be anybody across the street, and a butter isn't a butter. I would too. So Especially have, spe definitely on a two two way street. So not on not on a four lane. Who can I try to convince otherwise? I'd be interested in what what how case law has interpreted about yeah so i mean black black's law dictionary is really the one that we look at and it's to join at a border or boundary or to share a com common boundary with um to share a common boundary with so would that would they would the public right of way be a common boundary I would suggest no. So if you had a if you had a private way, so like in a subdivision, if somebody weren't to reserve that right and you had um, a, a right of way, what's called the derelict fee statute comes into play where each person would or each lot would own to the middle of that way. But if that road is accepted as a public way, it's essentially the fee of the road is with the town. So that's why I say yeah. in that instance, like in, in Mike's example, if it was a private way, I think we're, I think it's a different discussion. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so we spent some time thinking about it and that's where even that, so Mass General Laws 40A section 11 is like the parties and interest statute. And that's the one that distinguishes a butters. So that the sentence reads something like a butters comma, owners of land dire directly opposite on any public or private street or way comma. And so it's a, to me, it's a distinction between, because if, if a butter is meant what everybody's saying right across the street, why would you put owners of land directly opposite any public way? It's superfluous. And so it doesn't seem like that would be the meaning of a but. Um, so that's, that's kind of where, I think that's where we're coming from because it's, it's an industrially zoned site, if that makes anybody feel any better. So it's not like we're in a, a neighborhood. Well, that makes me feel a little better. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those difficult things uh, addressing Tom Reedy that every contingency and every nuance that could be calculated into a zoning bylaw cannot. And that's why they have the, the variance zoning board of appeals to appeal something like that. And then you would get a fair reading of, are there indeed neighbors uh, that are gonna be involved? And uh, it's something you're asking us that there is, seems to be some amb ambiguity, but we're concerned too about the neighbor, the neighborhood where it could be going. Yeah, and I guess you know, part, part of my thinking is, does this get us past go? Because I think if you, what I'd like you to say is, yeah, a, a butters are a budding next to adjacent to. Now that's nothing to say about what this could impact could be on the parties and interests. So under 29.5, you have specifically said, uh, the facility is designed to minimize any adverse visual or economic impacts on a butters and other parties and interests. So like you're taking into consideration the other people, which obviously I'm in front of you enough to know you always do that. Like you're always thinking about not just like, well, this is just what the bylaw says. We can't consider the neighbors. I think what I'm looking for is more of like a threshold issue of, you know, assuming that this is industrially zoned, assuming that it's a, it's a public way separating this at a point, right? So if I'm dropping as many hints as I can, where it's, um, there are no residences, ex residences except across a public way. And it was just for you, for 
and it's it's probably appropriate for the the building commissioner, but I think we have a relationship where we all talk to each other, and I, I mean, I treat the, the planning board like the zoning enforcement officer. How close is the industrial zone from where the transition to residential takes place? So maybe I'll, this is uh, for Mill Valley Road. So right at that tip, that's industrially uh -huh. zoned. All right. And across the street is, it's partially business and then it transitions into residential. But this is the beginning of the tip of industrial. So it's, it's, um, Jim, if you're working on it, it's, it's right at the tip where Mill yeah, Valley yeah, and okay, I, know, I know where you're talking. Yes. Yeah. Right, right, right. There's that single family home right there, which is industrially zoned. You can't do a whole heck of a lot other things with it. There's wetlands in the, on the easterly side. So in the back, so everything would be concentrated up towards that peak just naturally because of the, the environmental nature of the site. Um, directly across the street from like that tip, is it, it's all zoned business, but they're just houses there. So what are you asking us to, tonight, Tom, to interpret it in what way? And if we don't interpret it that way, we refer you to the Zoning Board of Appeals? Yeah, or I probably go to the building commissioner because I, I think we have a really good position on it. I'm asking you to interpret a but not to mean... In this, in this, for this limited circumstance, not to mean owners of land on the opposite side of a public way. So a butt's only a butt means adjacent to. Got to feel that there's been a case on this sometime. I I've got to I got to stand by my original comment that a butter is mean across the street in this particular case. That's my that's my opinion. It's always been interpreted that way because when yeah. you send out the notice, it's 300 feet, including across the street. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I mean, technically that's parties in interest. Like if you look at the statute, it's quote unquote parties in interest and not just a butters. And I think colloquially it's just become get your butters list. Yeah. Um, and that's, and maybe if, if that's where it is, that's where it is. But, you know, I'm, I know the town has used party and interest separately from a butter. And so you understand the difference, you know, linguistically between the two. So I think we have Ken Kamiya on. Do we have a but in our definitions no, that we are looking to adopt? I, no. I looked at it. It is not in there. <laughs> no. I think um, as Tom had suggested, well, and I think the board has, has come to the conclusion is um, there seems to be a reliance on the zoning act where, you know, I think it does suggest in, you know, uh, and I'm not an attorney, um, but it does suggest that across the street could be, you know, and, and, and as a planner, I've always assumed that a butt meant you know, whatever was required for a public note notification, as well as what was in section 11, which would be, you know, if they're shared some sort of common way, whether it's a private or a public right of way um, across the street. So, you know, I think, you know, the, the, um, yeah, I, that, that was, that, that's been my interpretation of a butter. And I don't think you've, I, you've defined it any other way. Um, and you rely on the zoning act to define that for you. Yeah, I, no. I, I tend to feel as though it's the, it, as, as Tom said, it's the colloquial interpretation when we say list of butters and that if you were going to split hairs, it's not, but do I want to err on that side? And then it could cascade into something that would not be in the best interest of our constituents. So I guess I would I would personally rather err on the side of saying across the street isn't a butter, even though you know just for the protection of our citizens, so that then anything that wants to go to the zoning board of appeals um, is the avenue they have to go. That's great. 
the now the, uh, just just a little bit of backup here. Some of this 300 feet also came from when we were looking at this. Northampton had just put in their first dispensary, and they had lines backing up. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of yards, traffic all over the place. Since then, for a variety of reasons, most dispensaries are nothing more than a store now with an occasional three or four people out front. They're, they aren't the um, traffic hazard, for lack of a better term, that they were three years ago. So, I mean, if they were to go for some relief from the ZBA, I, didn't, I don't know how much resistance they're going to get from any of the abutters because they seem to be pretty benign. I mean, you go to anybody around that has a dispensary now, and there's, there's quite a few of them. I mean, the lines are usually about 10 people. They stretch away because of social distancing. But, I mean, five or six or 10 people in a line now isn't much at all. Well, you know, they put a, a dispensary next to our office in Northampton. And you've got a Talbot's women's store there also. And it's completely changed the nature of that uh, complex across from the post office, okay? It's, it's not the same place because of the dispensary. And leave it at that. Uh, we're talking about leaving that location and Talbot's might be not be far behind. Okay. 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 So it sounds like I've got um, to inform my client and then there's a decision to make whether we, you know, seek something with Mr. Quinlan, have him render his decision and then work our way through the ZBA that way, or just seek a variance straight away. I'm not, I'm not sure. Or just say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. You know, we'll, we'll try to find either another site in town or another town. Um, I just think the landlord should have some interest in whether or not it fits with the complex, but that's a business decision, you know? That will be a single one, one store. That'll be it. Oh, that's yeah, it. That's, okay. Okay. That would be the proposal. It would just be standalone oh, okay. right at that. Okay. Okay. And like I said, pulled up closer to the street with visibility on route nine. So yeah, this, <clears throat> this is not where the tap room is. This is across the street from it. Correct. Right. This is the residential house that would be converted into a uh, building? Yes. Sale, okay. Yes. And it might not, I mean, that's a pretty tricky site. So it might just be the same footprint of the, the residence that you've got. And just maybe it's a, a gut and a, you know, come up to building code for commercial. And, you know, that's really it. So, I mean, it's, it's like, the, like the other group has said, and like I said in my opening, I mean, it's, it's slim pickings in town. As far as what sites are, I mean, we've checked. Glen LaPlante owns the spot next to Stables, and, and we've looked at that site, which would probably work, but that's a whole build, and, and not many of these dispensaries are willing to wait that long for it to oh, be they built it before there. they went go to occupy it. You know, Monroe Muffler is another one. We haven't, just, just as like yeah. what works as far as spacing from everybody, that one works. Um, but But then otherwise, I mean, there's really not a lot of space in town. Yeah, the Monroe I muffler wouldn't is. work because that is, um, it butts a residential use and we define residential use to include hotels, motels. Okay, and perfect. So then let me ask you, if, if you were, <laughs> so if a butt means adjacent to, and let's say Monroe, you take it and you do just a strip of three feet wide and cut it off. Is that then still abutting, right? If if we were to take that piece in between the Howard Johnson and the Monroe, put a strip four feet wide by as long as the property line is long, convey that to X Y Z Corporation to the Castro Fund. Pardon me. To the Castro Trust. Sure, that Kristen would love it. Um, you know, is that abutting anymore? And so, just as and I don't want to get mischievous with some of these things, but as we're looking at this and finding out what these words mean, 
know, part of my job is trying to figure out how to navigate within what those words mean. And so if we were to come with something like that, you know, is that better than having the residences across the street? I'm just trying to get some sense. And it may be all for naught um, if this other group goes through, gets a variance, and that's all she wrote. But I can tell you we get we get calls often asking. So so but are you looking at this for medical or um, adult use? Adult use. Okay. All right. So that's not 29 anyway. That would be 30. DD recalls uh, Tim Nyhart looking into Four Mill Valley. We couldn't find the reason, but there was something that held that up prior. Somebody okay. actually looked at that property. We, we just can't, you know, what it was that held, you know, that he had to deny that one. Okay. Do you think you might have that at the office? Is it something that's knowable or is that just like so far gone that you don't think you'll find it? We, we should be able to find out. Call Tim, if not. But okay. there was some oh. reason that he didn't denied it or didn't look into that property. Okay. And that's just Didi, you know, when he was looking for helping people out. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But you're looking as into that house, though, correct? Not correct. to build. Correct. So it might be a little different because it's somebody, I believe, was looking to build. Okay. And, of course, w between with conservation, too, because of the aquifer and everything else, because that is in part of the aquifer. So, you know, I think that was the thing that he discussed with conservation. Okay. But because maybe you are just looking at that house in particular, it, it could be different. Okay. But I know there was some questioning uh, behind it, but I'm not 100% sure what it was. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. And I think... Um, Bill, you're right as far as that setback. So that's something that we've got to look look at as well. Yeah. So section uh, section thirty is written a little bit differently than section twenty nine. So you might want to just take a look at that. But yeah. it, that's talking about uh, all marijuana stop establishments shall have a setback of at least three hundred feet from the nearest property line of any residential dwelling. So it seems like we need a variance regardless, is I think what we're saying. Possibly. You also have to deal with the fact that we only have two license authorized and both are right. spoken for. Right. That's the other piece. And it's not that's not lost on us either. Okay. But it's just it's understanding maybe some of the dynamics. A little bit. I mean, obviously, the heirloom collective is op operational, um, and the other group, you know, without knowing too much of the backstory, was given an approval. I think based upon a certain location, and I wonder if any of that has changed based upon a location change. So it's just if there's another because there are other fish in the sea, and I just don't know if there's you know maybe a potential there or this because what he said about financing. I mean, that's true. There's a lot of landlords out there that just some banks are okay with it, even some local banks, because they, they, I think, feel like the writing's on the wall. Um, but still. So it's something that we've got to certainly kick the tires on. Tom, if you're looking for a location in that area between the uh, vacuum store and uh, the rental space, there's a little parcel of land that's really a subdivision. It's called Random Walk. And it was supposed to be one of the few startup computer industries uh, way back when. Uh, remember the Random Walk theory? No. What was it? Mike, it, it is a way of pick, picking stocks, I believe. Was that it, Mike? It's also known as the Drunken Walk theory. You okay. can't pick one because day by day, you don't know which way the drunk's going to stagger. Okay. Or minute by minute. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Yeah, we'll um, we'll take a look. Like I said, folks are are interested. It, like I again, like I said, it may be for not, but um, thank you as always for for the conversation and the time. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you on something else soon. Okie doke. Okay. Thanks a lot. Right. Just as, as a note for Tom and Ken, Tom is the, the uh, building inspector. Ken is our Pioneer Valley Planning Commission contact 
for our uh, contract. Perfect. I, I knew Tom. I've known Tom. Um, Ken, good to meet you. Thanks nice for trying you. to help us out a little sure. bit. <laughs> okay. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next one in was uh, Jamie Callahan. Who is muted. Yeah, but he can hear. He should be able to hear us. Jamie Callahan, are you still there? You have the mic if you unmute. No, well, he's not answering. Mr. Ken. Um, I'm just here if you guys had any more conversation about the um, the bylaws that you have on the warrant. Well, we're, we're trying to, um, I'm gonna call into the Western Mass Builders Association in Springfield, trying to see if they have any standard to this. <laughs> Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, barely. There's a lot of background noise. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me uh, let me go outside. Okay, let's try that again. Can you hear me now? That's much better. Okay, so I'm <clears throat> on a meeting here regarding the uh, country Nissan. And I was asked to join the Zoom meeting regarding the uh, new pylon sign we're installing. And just want to answer any questions. So I just sent around the... <clears throat> Proposed designs today. Um, I don't know if everyone had a chance to look at them. Uh, I guess the question was, we didn't have uh, anything. We didn't have a before mm -hmm. and after. So we couldn't tell how big a change the, uh, the new design is from the old design. Okay. Uh, they are replacing the sign like for like, so the sign size is the same as existing. In terms same height, same width. The only small change is the logo is a little bit bigger. What's the dimension? Questions? What is the dimension? Uh, it's a, it's a 14 feet by four feet, 14 feet high by four, four feet wide. And I was wondering if the entire pylon counts as a sign or just the panel at the top. That was my question. It, um, I actually looked up the prior. Uh, that's an interpretation for the. Go ahead. And the square footage? <clears throat> no, no, I had I had access to the prior permit. I uh, DD had pulled and we looked at it square and footage. it was and it was on posts. And now it's you know, I consider more of a monument sign, it's solid, even though the writing's not on it. And that was my concern with not a you know equal change they're going to re they propose to remove the existing one and and add on the existing slab a new sign but it's a solid base yeah i was interpreting the sign as the red panel since there was no writing or any symbol or any branding on the five panels below that i don't know if anyone else on the on the board feels otherwise or if they've even seen it. What's, I don't the, think, I don't what's think the address for the property, do you know? Or I'm sure it's here. I believe it's 30 uh, Russell Street, is it? 
40. Is the intent of the solid panel to simply be? 40, thank you. Yeah, 40, yeah. Nothing more than a solid panel and never anything else put on there? Thank you. Uh, no, as far as I know, there's no additional signage going on that. The only branding is the Nissan logo that's going to be on the sign. But is, isn't the purpose of the solid? They only sell one? one product there, Nissan. Well, I was like, I was wondering about like any kind of, uh, you know, advertising for cars on sale or some kind of a special or something like that. That's all. Oh, I would say clearly that. The uh, no, I have no indication that that's going to happen. But the solid part is part of the sign. If it weren't, you'd have it's part of the sign. Or you could argue it supports the sign. I mean, we could. Well, you, you, know, you don't. You don't need that kind of structure to support a sign. What's the color? Is it red? Silver. No, you don't structurally need it, but it it gives a more solid aesthetic look. So you could argue that it's instead of having it look like you know, a lollipop on posts, this makes it look more substantial. You know, so it's, you know, you could argue that either way. I it's think not our, I understand what you're saying, but it's not our job to worry about aesthetics. And the fact that you said it, said that it's aesthetically more pleasing makes it even more like a sign than. Well, well, no, because then you have the question of the guy that wants to do the the uh, Hopkins Academy. Do you count every brick or where the where the sign text is in set? You know, because he's choosing to go with a brick look. I mean, I couldn't we stipulate? It's also not. It's also not. So what's the total? What is the total square footage of the white part in addition to the red part? On that I don't know, but if we approved the red part, couldn't we? Uh, I don't have that right in front of me, but couldn't we stipulate that the white part could not have any messaging or signage similar okay. to what we told the gas station about their flags? They just put a colored flag with no no text. Okay. The, uh, you know, haven't, haven't there been other issues with this site also? The setback from the road, cars are parked within the 50-foot setback. Isn't that true, Dr. Zagrodnik? That is true. And I can remember when Lisa Sanderson was on, and she was fairly adamant about the fact that they were supposed to change it. And we said, we'll worry about that the next time Country Nissan comes in for something else. And I don't quite remember what the issue was, but it had to do with parking the cars in the front of the 50 foot setback from Route 9. That is, Bill, Jim? Yeah, when, we, when, we, <clears throat> when cut, Nissan came in, they wanted to expand their parking lot. They bought, lot, bought a house next door and either knocked it down or moved it. And at that time, there, uh, they were parking in front of the showroom and also uh, a, a little bit to the west in the 50 foot front yard setback. And they said that uh, we, we said we gave them some time to move it back, but they never moved it. That, that's correct. Plus they had, they almost had some cars on a, a riser there. It looked like it was cantilevered over route nine practically. So there was, more concerns, but I think that's the correct interpretation, Bill. So what you're saying is that they had agreed to do something which they didn't do, Bill? Yes, but the fact is that it was not enforced, and it yeah. it may have lapsed by now. So I just went on Google uh, Maps into Street View, and what is there, the sign is on posts, but the posts themselves are wrapped with metal. And uh, there's some red paint in the middle, but it's uh, it's almost if you visualize a person standing there uh, with two legs uh, parallel to the road. Yes, there is a space between the legs, but it's a very small space. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, back up a bit. 
on this sign, you've got the pylon sign, and then there's one is is so the the there's a wall sign and there's a pylon sign. Okay, so the wall. Okay, we got a wall sign and a pylon sign. Now, even if we assume that the metal part of the road pylon sign is part of the sign, the sign is 12 feet tall by roughly four feet wide. That's 48 square feet. We're allowing 64 square feet. So the Nissan is within the 64 square feet, even if we use the metal on the bottom. It's a moot point. Okay. The whole sign consists of less than 64 square feet. And I thought he said the red part was 14 by four. What? He said the red part was 14 by four, didn't he? No. The, no, the it's the red part. Have, the drawing we have says the whole sign is 12 feet high by three foot seven inches wide. Okay. Well, then, okay. Okay, I misinterpreted what you said. Yep, you got bingo. The 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 wall sign is uh four foot by well say four and a half feet by seven foot. That's roughly 30 square feet. Okay. Maybe a little more, give or take. And so, the wall sign is substantially what is there already. Right. And in any case, they're allowed 64 square feet for each. They are within a 64 square feet of each. So the signs comply. As far as the lighting internally illuminated, gooseneck, grandfathered. Yeah, I'm sure it's grandfathered. I'm sure I think it's internal. I think the signs are internally illuminated. I think you're right. How about this one? Yeah, it says it's a translucent polycarbonate. That's correct. The sign. Yeah, and they, they have been ever since uh, which we'll call it was there. Well, they've been they've been internally illuminated for a long time. So that's grandfathered. So did we answer Tom Quinlan's question? If about the sign and the details you were looking for. Well, Mr. Quillen was wondering about the bottom of the sign being part of the sign. And it looks like it's solid. Completely. If we, it doesn't matter because the, from the bottom of the sign to the top of the sign is 12 feet. The sign is four feet wide. If, even if we lock. include the metal silver underneath the red, it's all 48 square feet. Okay. He's allowed, like I said, he's allowed 64. Is so in that case, the sign is complying mm -hmm. with the bylaw. Although it's two-sided, isn't it? Also, most signs are two-sided. Okay. Yeah, we only count one face. Right. Okay. All right. So Tommy's right. He, you know, the, the sign would be, if we consider everything, but like I said, we could sit here and discuss that all day, but the sign is compliant with the whole kit and caboodle. We're arguing about nothing. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> But we still have an outstanding concern or about enforcing their... I think that enough time has passed that um, we're, uh, we're kind of stuck with that. Unless they want to be good neighbors. Jamie, do you want to be good neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> He's the sign contractor. So. <laughs> We could beat him up all we want, but he, he has no control over that one. <laughs> I'm just the installer. He doesn't have an iron in the fire. <laughs> I'm just the contractor putting the sign up. <laughs> so do you want us to take a vote, Tom, or are you satisfied with what you've heard? I'm satisfied. That's fine. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. So you don't need Thanks, any Tom. You're okay. good, Tom? Okay. All right. Very good. Okay, you're good to go. Move on. Get your permit. See Tom tomorrow. He'll give you a permit. Okay. Thank you, board members. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Jamie. All right. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Bye. What's up next, Mister Dwyer? That would be back to Ken.
So Jim, you were saying that you um, have uh, contacted the Western Mass Builders Association. I've got a call into Western Mass. I think they're called Western Mass Building Association. Like I said, they're on Cadwell Drive in Springfield. And to try to see if they have, I'm waiting for a call back. I'm going to give a call. I will call them again, contact them again tomorrow to see if I can get anything out of them. Um, I go by there probably three or four times a week. So if I have to, I'll stop in and even ask them. I think um, both you and I contacted the same person or at least the same um, body. So I just yeah. got an email from, um, because I think at the last meeting, I suggested that um, I contacted the Home Builders and Remodelers Association of Western Mass. And they're just looking at um, the executive director's signature at, it's on Cadwell Drive in Springfield. Okay. And um, he responded to my email, which was, which basically asked um, if there's a resource for annual cost of home building in the Pioneer Valley or by county, or if there are any specific resources with regards to this. And then in the email this evening, he said, and this is what I was expecting he'd say, um, is when it comes to the cost of home building, there are far, far too many variables to consider to just blurt out a number. Size, shape, location, actual town or city are a few things to consider. If this information is critical to your project, please contact me for further discussion. Um, so I was going to respond, um, basically saying that it, it's being used in a formula, but really it, it my, my ask was to find and, and figure out if there was a um, annual resource that just had numbers. Um, I looked at the census I, um, and the, um, the various data collection that the federal government does with regards to this, and I couldn't find anything. Um, and then I, um, I do have an email to reach out to um, someone on our PVPC team that handles a lot more data needs than I do. So I'm not, you know, I, I'm, I'm still looking, um, but yeah, that's, I guess that's where we are. So. I may give the general, the person a call. Did you have, do you have a name on there that you're talking to? Yeah, Andrew Crane, Andrew he's the executive Crane, director. Okay. I may call him and simply let him know, you know, I'm the, from the Hadley Planning Board, why we want to do this. And if he can't give me a number, you know, I, I can I, I can see where he's coming from, but can you give us some kind of guidance? Right. Of where, not so much where to go, but how can we do this without letting a developer pick the number on themselves? Is there, you know, can, can he help us in any way? Right. That makes sense. Yeah. There is, there is, I wonder there is, if somebody like is, Home Depot would have numbers. I mean, they know what costs are. Um, uh, estimators, estimators will use RS means. RS means is a publication that comes out, I think, annually. Um, there's a commercial, but there's also a residential. That would, I, I don't have it because I don't do residential, but I would imagine that they have a base unit number and then you add on for each condition or, you know, how many gables, how many, you know, are you doing a shoebox? Are you doing, you know, and everything adds on to it, but they might have a general, and then they also have regional adjustments. At least that's what I remember when I used to use them. Um, but I thought when I asked the Western Mass AIA that they might refer me to that, and they didn't even mention that. So um, I'm going to try again. calling and contacting a couple of uh, lumber yards like Cowles and Leader and see if they have anything because they've they estimate some stuff too. Um, Tom, do you ha have you do you know of anything where we can get an idea? We're looking for the wholesale cost of a residential building, say somewhere between twelve and fourteen hundred square feet, to be used for this uh, subsidized housing donation to the Hadley Affordable Trust Fund. So, if a developer wanted to um, put in a subdivision of so many houses that have to put it, put in so much affordable housing into it. They could either put the affordable housing up or they could donate to a fund. And the fund was approved at the last town meeting. We're trying to get a formula together 
based on the wholesale cost of the house, the mortgage, and the cost of the lot. Cost of the lot is pretty straightforward. Cost of the mortgage is pretty easy to come by. You just go to a couple of banks. Okay, this is the interest rate. This is the mortgage. That's it. But the wholesale cost of the house is where we're trying to struggle with. The town council has recommended we use the prevailing wage law. That's got to drive the cost of a building that's, out of sight. That's an unbelievable wild card because we're getting the money at a predictable cost that an ordinary developer would would charge. And then if we take a house and build it through our affordable housing trust fund, the, the cost is going to be dramatically escalated because of the prevailing wage. Yeah. Well, so we not gonna, would, that's not going to be a good deal for the town. And, and we wouldn't be building stuff through the affordable, the housing trust fund would not be building houses. The, the idea is the money would go towards developers to help defray certain costs and they would still do the, build the building. Oh, yeah. I, it, it is but, not the intention that the town would build and own the stuff. Well, I, I was just thinking if there was a house that came up because of tax situations and somebody just walked away from it and we said, well, we have this money, we can rehab it for affordable housing. But uh, probably just a thought. Yeah, I don't think the selectman would be too keen on that and neither would most of the uh, town forefathers, for people, because yeah. it, it would just be, they don't want to be landlords. We do not do well managing real estate. You're right, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, it's a, Tom, it's a real know, tough call. It's a real, I mean, you, you used to say 180, 200 square foot. Um, we're at 250 any builder you talk to now. Um, lumber, you know, board foot has gone down with the market, but it hasn't caught up with the, you know, with your local lumber yards yet. Yeah. Um, I actually sat in a few meetings in Southampton on the affordable homes because it, it was at the point, I want to say they had three or 400,000 sitting and they wanted, you know, so went into different meetings and um, they wanted to, you know, offer the appliances to make it work. It, it ended up that most of the builders feedback along with the realtors said that you almost had to give a whole lot in order to make it feasible in a town like Southampton, which is going to be comparable to Hadley. Right. Um, land's, land's more expensive in Hadley than Southampton. You're right, Tom. The same thing happened in Sunderland. You're right. One house or two houses would not cut it. No, the money, they're just sitting on the money, unfortunately, um, and, and basically have to buy the lot and give it to the, you know, in order to do the affordable housing. How many housing building permits have you gotten in the last four months? We are up 20 or 30,000 from last year already in permits. Wow. Um, we, we, it, it's crazy, but new houses, um, yeah, six. In the works right now, we have at least six. I'm, six. I'm just guessing. And um, what would be normal? Yeah, I think well, people are waiting for the price of lumber to come down. It, it, it may not. Per year. That's, uh, that's what Tim Nahart always used to say. Yeah. What did he say? I'm sorry. I missed that. 10, 10 to 12 houses per year average range. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds. We, we I think we'll be over that. Believe it or not, with the price of lumber, um, we still like I said, two on my desk right now that are still going to go through. Um, but the price is it, it's if you can get a lot of materials, um, you know, shelving's a problem. Um, your plastics, PVCs are through the roof. Um, roof like roofing, you can only get two or three colors, four colors. Most manufacturers, um, you know, accessories for the vinyl are tough. Uh, it, it's it's not. It's not easy. <laughs> so most of it's remodeling that's coming through. It's good to know. Thank you, Tim. Yep. So anyway, Ken, that's kind of what we're standing to look where we're, that's where we are right now. Everything else seems to be okay. Town meeting obviously been pushed off for, um, well, three more weeks, I guess, Bill. Uh, yes. November 14th, yeah. Well, it would be a shame if, you know, someone came up with a brilliant formula and we couldn't come up with one of the variables. <laughs> <laughs> we got so, the formula. We just got to fine tune that, that the oh, yeah, I'm how, to get, yeah. reason, how to reasonably, so how to ensure that the wholesale cost is somewhere near correct. Oh, 
Has the um, has your town council suggested anything with regards to um, adopting the rules and regs that would provide that formula and the variables, or as far as a timeline for that? Because obviously, I think with the way that the the planning board drafted the bylaw, it suggests um, you know a reference to uh, rules and regs. Um, was there any guidance with that? No, that that's, that's, a good, that's a good point, Ken, because certainly if we wanted to make some uh, slight tweaks to the this affordable housing trust fund, we can make it very simply through the rules I, and regulations. But if we have to go through a whole zoning change, it's another year waiting. So thank you for that point. Yeah, yeah we gotta, we'll have to move on once I mean, the, the town meeting is three weeks away, but we've got to move on the rules and regs or at least parts of them to get those adopted. Of course, we can always continue to add to them. Yep. So we'll keep looking. We have another meeting. Uh, so we're scheduled. Uh, our next scheduled meeting is November 3rd, which is election day. Uh, so we cannot hold public hearings, but we can hold a, um, a business meeting. Um, and this will be probably the the main topic of how we're going. We'll have to get some sort of an ascertainable standard so that we can amend the zoning article uh, on town meeting floor to put in whatever we come up with. Yeah, we could. We just go back to the original wording too. Yeah, uh, we could go back to uh, or or. Uh, we could go back to the uh, developers demonstrated costs. Right. So if um, if developer A can cut a better deal because he's a uh, better customer at uh, Kohl's, then uh, maybe he'll be contributing a little less to the subdivision. And developer B, who isn't as popular with the lumber yards, may end up paying a little more to get to buy out of uh, putting the affordable unit in. You know, that, that's, that's a very possibility. Uh, and, and I like that because we can kind of put the onus on the developer to give us the cost. We can check them or, or do a little due diligence on them, but uh, you know, we don't have to be running around trying to figure it out at, 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 the, at the moment. I mean, between Mark and Tom Quinlan, I mean, they, they probably have a better feel than than anybody, about I think Tom, I think Tom Quinlan should. I, I'm going to resign as a trustee and ask that you appoint Tom Quinlan as a trustee for the trust. But you, <laughs> no, you don't have to resign, Mike. He can still be. A, he can be an addition too. I think it'd be a great addition. Correct. At least, at least as a two cent advisor for us, that would be a, a better thing. Even yeah, well, you've got to take it up with the select board. Anytime I can help. Anytime. <laughs> I I feel that Mike's goal of calculating this is is a a um, admirable, but I don't think it can be. I think as, as we're hearing, you know, there are just too many variables, and you know, one you know, and the quality of the house and the shape, but you know, there's just way too many variables to to, to put a dollar value. Are we statutorily do we have to tie it to a building construction cost or can we make a quasi arbitrary number that is meant to be in, in that area? Because I don't think we can pin that down. It, it's just, um, I think we're going to chase our tails on that. So the, um, <clears throat> if you recall, I sent a list around of excerpts from or formulas from other communities across the state. Mm -hmm. And um, someone commented that those are all over the place. And yes, it, we could be as arbitrary as we want. Some are trying to discourage buyouts. Others apparently are trying to encourage buyouts. Mm -hmm. I think Amherst had something like twice the annual medium, median wage for a single uh, single person in the at the 80% of... Uh, 
I forget, I forget what it was, but it, it's going to be something like a couple of hundred thousand dollars to buy out from building in Amherst. Other communities had much more realistic uh, formulas. Um, maybe I'll go back and revisit that, and see if anything jumps out as uh, some of them did attempt to do a formula and try to keep it in proportion. If you're putting in a high-end subdivision uh, and you want to buy out of putting an affordable unit in, we might expect to get a little more from you than if you are putting in units that are just a bit above the affordable threshold. So, so why haven't some the uh, why haven't the developments on off of Shattuck Road contributed to the Predated. Predated. They, they were put in before the uh, inclusionary zoning bylaws. Ah. So they were approved before this inclusionary zoning bylaw. So even though content building is still continuing, we can't it all go goes, back. Huh? It all relates back to the filing date of the preliminary plan. Right. Ah. That freezes the regulations that apply to that project. Pretty much for the life of the project. Right. Too bad because millions of dollars would have probably come into the trust from that project. Huh? Millions. But to be fair, you know, if Mike wants to build a house and he starts the process and then we come along and legislate some changes because we don't like Mike, that's not fair. So, of yeah. Course, of course, of course. Absolutely. I'm just saying. Build a house with what the standards were when he started. So. But on the other side of the coin, if you think that uh, if somebody is going to put a 12 lot subdivision in and one of the units has to be affordable, he's going to add the cost down to the people buying those market rate houses. He's, he's going to amortize it. Yeah. So it's a redistribution. There's no easy answer on this one. Nope, you're right. Well, it was a good intellectual exercise, at least. You know, what are, what's really being subsidized? That's what should be going into the kitty. Uh, let's see. Anything else, Ken? Um, no, I, I guess um, one thing is if... Um, Board members are interested. The uh, Citizen Planner Training Collaborative just announced their um, sessions. If you're interested to attend, I just got an email. So um, they're all virtual. Um, but I know that Mark came last year to um, one of them held at PVPC. Um, but just an announcement. What's it called again? Citizen Collaborative? Citizen Planner Training Collaborative. I went to a, couple, a session up at Holy Cross two years in a row. Is oh, that's right. Mike, you were there too. Mike that's and Mike. Right. That's right. So yeah. That's the same thing, huh? Yeah, that's the same one. It was kind of fun going up there, taking a little ride. So if we don't get the email, we could go to the PVPC website? I'll send, a, I'll send a, um, the email to the board or to Jim and Bill. Thank you. Okay. It's, when is it, Kim? Um, it's from October 28th till the beginning of December. Okay. So these are virtual. Okay. Um, so um, it's sporadic evenings through the through the through that time frame. Damn, I like the cookies at PBPC. <laughs> yeah, maybe next time. Hopefully <laughs> next year. <laughs> this is a public service to the rest of the board. Tomorrow's. Tomorrow night's selectmen's meeting, they are having one of one of the items on the agenda is a discussion of how to address the traffic on Cross Path Road, Cemetery Road, West Street, and what's the one along the dike? North Lane. North Street. North Lane. North Lane. North Lane. And they're trying to, they have several ideas, and that's on the agenda to discuss how to alleviate um or address the traffic issues on traffic and speed issues of the cars on those roads. So, and they meet at six thirty. Five thirty. Five thirty. Five thirty. No. Five thirty. Oh wow. 
Okay. They still go to, um, they still go on and on, but at least they're, it, it rarely goes to nine. Okay. But it, hey, Tom, Mr. Uh, Wayne Abercrombie was having a light problem over here. Yes. Sent a thank you note to Tim Nyhart, but it, it probably was meant to you, to be sent to you. So I uh, said, so pretty sure the reduction in light spill over at the house from Eversource is due to your work. <laughs> thank, thank you. That's glad to hear. That, that work order was from January. We have about an 80% reduction in light coming into our bedroom windows. It appears they aim them more toward the ground. The reduction would be 100% if they lowered the lights on the poles. Thanks to you and yours truly for your help. So there's been some improvements. He so appreciates that, that, that. That has been improved, Mike? That's what, that's what he said, yeah. yeah. Good. Glad to hear it. Good. Thank you, Tom. Anytime. Thank you. But, you know, truly amazing. The, the lights on uh, East Street Common Drive are beautifully designed but it reminded me of the lighting concern that we had over the Holiday Inn. Remember those beautiful, historic looking lights that everybody complained about? Yeah. Because you're looking right at the bulb. Yes. You're looking. So that's, that's for Tom Quinlan. This is why we are, we pretty much ask for the shoebox light so that the one foot candle would not be creeping over onto the abutting property. Yeah, you might want to take a drive by East Street Commons and take a gander at night. I Pretty usually run around there early in the morning and it, it's been much better. I saw it the other day. <laughs> yeah. I had the issue with um, Lowe's with the, uh, a butter in the front, a renter. And they put, I think, four more, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, diversions. Uh, basically, they they blocked the light, so that one went away as well. The uh, manager was able to get them to do that with a work order. So you mean, uh, when, when Lowe's, first, Lowe's first went in and they had their high bay lighting in their garden area, it lit up Algonquin Drive like it was daylight. Oh, well, I believe it. <laughs> that was, it was like, we were by, I mean, they had pictures, They because a couple of butter, the neighbors came in and I mean, you're talking what a quarter mile away? Yeah. It was. I mean, those lights up in the high bay were. Uh, I mean, they 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 lit up the whole area and beyond. And we they, somebody went to I forgot who it was that went to was it the planning board or the building inspector back then or whoever it was, and they were real nice and they shielded them. And within about it probably took about a month or two. And the lights were greatly improved as far as coming out of that high, the, uh, the greenhouse, the high bay where they got the, the flowers outside stuff. Like it's like a big glass area. Yep. Yeah. Just, just curious uh, to Tom Quinlan, the, uh, the butter, would that be due east of the property right on Route 9? Yes, sir. Yep. <laughs> and uh, that person uh, who owns the property uh, <laughs> were smiling <laughs> He held up the whole loan loans project. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Uh. So sometime, Tom, when you when you got a few minutes, I'll give you the history of that one and what oh. was recommended and what Lowe's came back with and what happened out of it. It was something. Okay. <laughs> That's an, it was an, it's an interesting comment. That's interesting. The manager has been very good. I was out there again today because they're already holiday shopping. They're, they're blocking the aisles. And Mike, uh, Chief Spakenable, noticed the other day. So I stopped out there and, and uh, he said, give them a couple of days. We're going to start clearing the aisles and that. But they're rearranging was his excuse. Um, but egresses were blocked big time already. And we're only October. So he's, he's been very cooperative, the new manager. Good. <clears throat> Anything else? I have nothing else. I have nothing else. Move we adjourn. All right. Second. second. Motion is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is history. Thank you and thank you, John. <laughs>